got to really target what you're writing to the publication and to their audience to make it relevant for them. But you know that's something that's that's definitely doable. So and it's something that gets easier over time. And then we realized that there's an information overload. I mean, we're all being bombarded with news, with advertising constantly. And so it's possible that even if you get great coverage of an issue, somebody might not see it. Somebody you want to see it may miss it. And so that's just sort of a reality. And again, you know, the more compelling our stories are, the more likely that they're going to get in the paper, on the you know nightly news, whatever it is that your goal is. You know, will happen, and hopefully people will actually listen and get it and, and take that call to action to heart. So there's this whole idea of what's newsworthy, and that's where it becomes you know, really important what, what kind of news we're presenting, what kind of ideas we're presenting to reporters. And timeliness is arguably the most important element of newsworthiness because you know you want your story to be of the moment, relevant. Everybody's fighting to break the latest story. You know, all these news channels are in competition with one another. So you want to make sure that what you're presenting is timely, that it's relevant. And so there are some ways that we can do that. We can announce an event, say we're having some sort of a press conference or a community summit or a neighborhood town hall meeting. Well, we want to announce that before it happens so that perhaps we get some free event coverage and more people will show up to our event as well as some reporters might show up and actually cover your event. So then you have the double benefit that more people came if the event coverage, the pre-coverage happens. And then if not, if they come to the actual event or if they do both, then maybe more people will hear about what you're doing even if they didn't go to the event. So that can be really powerful. You can also time something with an event. So let's say there's you know, a big holiday and we want to do a story about healthy eating and how you know we're in this culture of overconsumption. That's a kind of interesting angle. And yeah, I mean people in the holidays are going to be writing stories about food and the culture of food and what people are eating. So that's something. We can also time things to a big national event. So we've all seen with this, you know, terrible tragedy in Arizona how so many people have run various stories, kind of angles from that big event. So people are talking about gun control now. You know, that's been a sort of an avenue for people to start that conversation again. They're also talking about mental health, which of course in public health we're really concerned about that. So you know, organizations that are working on mental health issues are saying, hey, listen up, we need more money to, to run our programs. This is obviously a problem. So that's another way that you can make sure your coverage is timely. Uh, prominence is another important thing. So if you are able to connect what you're doing to a celebrity um, or some sort of, you know, issue of prominence, then that's going to increase your chance of getting coverage. So Michelle Obama. I don't think there's a person in this country that doesn't know the Let's Move campaign by now or it doesn't know that childhood obesity is a problem in this country because it is so pervasive in the news media. It's just everywhere. And because Michelle Obama is a celebrity figure, anytime she goes to any even like tiny event related to childhood obesity, it becomes a major news event and everybody's covering it. So we may not be lucky enough that we have Michelle Obama in our back pocket working with us, but we do have some other you know, local celebrities who care about the issues that we're working on. So let's say, for instance, you're going to host a press conference about the state of school food in New Orleans. If you could somehow convince Chef Emerald to come, who's been involved in that conversation, you're going to increase your likelihood that people are going to cover that event because he's somebody with celebrity status. And because the issues that we work on are so important, feel good issues, you know, it's actually pretty reasonable to, to think that a local celebrity might come to your event. You know, maybe it's a New Orleans Saints player talking about the importance of physical activity. It's, it's a, a realistic idea. And then proximity. So we talked about how this one size fits all approach does not work anymore. We really need to target our stories. <coughs> with a local angle. So you've got to make sure if you're pitching to the Times Picayune and you want something to run in the metro section, you better make sure that it's relevant to residents of Orleans Parish and to the Times Picayune readership. How does it affect them? Why do they need to know? Uh, why is it important that they hear about it? So those are some things to keep in mind. 
as well as there's a few other elements of what's newsworthy, and that's significance. And again, here's where we get lucky in public health in that most everything that we're working on is significant, and it generally does affect a lot of people. And any issue that affects a lot of people is generally newsworthy. So let's say something comes out about spinach, and you know we found that there's another batch of spinach that's got E. coli. Well, you better believe when the State Department of Health calls whatever news medium and tells them, hey, we need you to, to put this out there, people need to know about this, they're going to cover it because obviously it impacts a lot of people and the health and safety of a lot of people. So that's just sort of a, a basic public health example. Unusualness. Anytime something is so strange and out of the ordinary, it's more likely to get media coverage. So let's say, for instance, you know, you're working on school food and you convince the school to let the students take over their cafeteria for a day. Well, that would be really strange, right? That would be unusual. So there's a good chance if you were to be able to pull off a stunt like that, you would get some media coverage from it and you would sort of generate conversation about what do kids really want and what do they deserve to be eating at school. Conflict. Everybody knows that we're reading about conflict all the time, and the news tend to proliferate that really by asking for different opinions. You know, they want to present opposing sides, and, and people care about things that, that are surrounding conflict. And also newness. If anything is new, if there's a new program that's going to benefit people, if some uh, wellness center is opening up, a new hospital, obviously that's going to impact a lot of people. We want them to know about it, and it's newsworthy because it's new. So there are a lot of things that you can do to create news, and one of those is to you know host a special event. So um, you know maybe it's a press conference about a report, or it's you know an evening at the edible schoolyard checking out their garden and the program that they're doing there. Maybe it's a contest at the Prevention Research Center. Last fall, we held a health promotion rap contest for youth in New Orleans. And that was sort of inherently newsworthy and fun because it was a contest. We wanted people to know about it. And so we were able to get some coverage of that contest because the, the media wanted people to know about it and wanted them to participate. Um, polls and surveys. When new polls or surveys come out about you know what Americans think, feel, do, we're constantly hearing about those things in the news. Top 10 lists. We always read those. They're fun. People enjoy them. They can be applied to public health. Product demonstrations, rallies and protests, personal appearances by, say, a, you know, a local celebrity talking about an issue. Uh, those are all you know, newsworthy sort of events. They're things that we can do, sort of premeditate and do, and generate some coverage for our organizations and our issues by doing them. So now we're going to go over our first example of media advocacy, a successful media advocacy campaign. So hopefully you guys picked up the articles. There are two that are related to this first example, and Shokafe will, will give them to you if you didn't get them. But the first example is from Twin Span to Linear Park, which is sort of funny, but there's two different Basically what happened is that you know, Hurricane Katrina came through, devastated New Orleans, and really badly damaged the old I-10 twin span that connects Slidell to New Orleans. And so uh, the government had to come in and they had to rebuild stronger, uh, better bridges that could withstand you know, future hurricanes. But what happened is that in the, in the process we have this old infrastructure, this great kind of miles and miles of really powerful concrete over water that's strong enough to support an 18-wheeler, so it could certainly support people that say want to use it to fish or they want to walk or bike on this, um, you know, on this bridge. So it sort of it created an interesting opportunity. And so Richard, Dr. Richard Campanella, who is an assistant research professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Tulane, he was sort of the first um, person to really recognize this idea and recognize it publicly. And then Bob Marshall, an outdoor journalist for the Times Picayune, you know, had a conversation with him, and the two of them really kept up this very strong media advocacy effort. 
So the first article was written on April 25th by Bob Marshall. And in this article, this is one that you guys don't have. But in this article, he basically presents uh, Richard Campanella's idea, which is, why don't we preserve one end of this South Shore twin span and ideally let's use it as a five mile linear park over water. I mean, this is great, we have this infrastructure, why uh, demolish something that could be used for public benefit? So that was the idea. Um, and basically he mentioned that the North Shore was doing this all along and that they said, we're gonna preserve one end and make it a fishing pier for people. And they kind of generated a lot of momentum about that early on and secured the resources, got the government behind them. They were good to go. But no similar movement was happening on the South Shore side. And so Richard Campanella said, why is, you know, why aren't we doing this? This is crazy. And uh, Barb Marshall wrote the first article about it. Now, he outlined a lot of the benefits, you know, which is smart. That's obviously what we wanted to do. He said, this will be great for ecotourism. There are so many people in the city that want to fish and crab, and they can't because they don't have a boat. And evidently, our beautiful wetlands make it hard for people to engage in bank fishing. They can't do it because it's just, um, you know, it, it doesn't lend itself to that. So you really need a boat. But here we've got this stretch of concrete that people can go fish off of. So that was sort of the opportunity. Also, if people can walk and bike and run, over water. I mean, that's that's so appealing. That would be great for people. And we're trying to increase environmental access to physical activity opportunities. Now, he did also outline the costs, obviously. And that would be, if we were going to do this whole five-mile plan, we'd have to construct restrooms, potentially concession stands, which we could certainly make some money off of that, but it would be costly, and then parking. So then he says what needs to happen is that we really need Mayor Landry to show some interest and support. And he's asking people to contact the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and the Department of Public Works. So, so mind you, look at the stretch of time. So this article uh, was published in April. The next article that comes out is actually an op-ed. So that's one of the things that we talked about in the PR toolbox. And that's something that we can all write pretty easily. So Richard Campanella comes out a few months later and he writes this op-ed on June 11. And he basically outlines, so this one you guys have, it looks like this. It's titled, Chance to Turn Twin Spans into Public Pier is Slipping Away. So it's sort of a compelling title, like let's not miss this opportunity. And he basically says that the BP oil disaster happened. This should remind us of the incredible resource that we have. We have this unbelievable wildlife and fishing infrastructure here and we need to benefit from it and it's totally crazy to demolish these bridges that could be used for public benefit and so he outlines the department of transportation development's plan to demolish the twin spans he again mentions this idea let's create a five mile pedestrian bridge and how would people benefit from that there are so many ways he says that the challenge is the price tag but he sort of you know lightly criticizes the Department of Transportation by saying that I get that it's a lot of money. It's actually $44 million was the plan to make this five-mile um, linear park over water. But he says, okay, so yes, it's costly, but why aren't we equally looking at the benefits of creating this and all the you know economic growth that could come from that? So he kind of puts that call to action out there. And then he says that uh, the demolition is going to start in August, and that even if we can't convince people to create this whole awesome linear bridge over water, which just sounds amazing, then at the very least, let's not demolish the thing. Let's keep part of it and make it a fishing pier like they're doing on the North Shore. Why, why can't we do that? And by the way, I think that cost the North Shore about like $14,000 or something. It was pretty inexpensive, shockingly inexpensive to do that. So much less than the hefty price tag for creating the whole linear bridge. So then the next article, so we're up to three articles now. Bob Marshall comes back on November 28th and he writes another article about this issue. And this time he specifically addresses all the audience in the beginning, <coughs> which is sort of an unusual news story. But you guys have a copy of this and he basically says, this is a special message for all these different people. And if you read the categories, it's hard to imagine that, you know, you, you don't personally fall into one of them or you don't know somebody who does, you know? So it, it automatically says to me, 
wow, I should care about this.